Hello everyone, I'm Adam with D&D Beyond. Thank you for joining me for today's development update and community Q&A session. Today's lineup, latest updates, as always, what's in the pipeline, ask me anything. So if you have questions, you can start asking those right now by putting the word question in front of your question in chat. And we're gonna collect those and I'll get through as many as I possibly can at the end of the show. And then we're gonna do another homebrew spotlight today. So lots and lots of positive feedback the last time that we did this. And so we will start doing it, uh, you know, a little more frequently, maybe once a month or so is the current plan. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but today I've had some chosen, uh, ask for some submissions on Discord and had them chosen by our community team. So uh, I'm actually gonna come into some of these kind of cold. So it's gonna be me discovering these along with you. Uh, so so yeah, we'll have a good time with the spotlight. Uh, and, and again, if you have questions, make sure that you start asking those right now and we will uh, get to those. All right, latest updates. So Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. We've got a lot of activity going on right now related to everything that's coming in that book. I am sure that if you are keeping up with the news, you are aware of all lots and lots of content is coming with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. We're really excited about it. So uh, the Wizards of the Coast team has talked about customizing your origin, class feature options, new subclasses, lots more in that book. We are really, really heads down right now trying our best to uh, you know get that content and uh, implement all of the content that we possibly can before that book comes out. And obviously we are prioritizing the really, really big pieces. One of the things that I wanted to share uh, just very transparently with everyone is as we have been looking into the implementation of the playtest versions of some of these things, we are uh, at a point and, and we kind of have been at a point for the, the last few weeks in particular, once we've uh, kind of gotten eyes on what is going to be in the book and, and what you know is not going to be. And we are not going to be releasing any playtest versions of these ahead of this book. And uh, this is because there are uh, pretty significant changes between them, not mechanically, so I'm not spoiling anything mechanically. It is far more just technically what we have to implement. And so uh, we were kind of afraid uh, of this. And, and this is one of the reasons that we've been trying to implement this in the right way. The good news is because of some of the, the refinement that has happened to that, we're going to be able to implement it. So I'm not, I'm not worried about being able to get this in place for the book release, but it just simply means that we will not be getting out ahead of that with any playtest versions of this. So again, I wanted to share that with everyone today. And uh, this is just kind of how it goes when things are in progress design or development or anything else. And, and uh, again, looking on the positive side of that, it does mean that we are very prepared. And so uh, this was kind of the reason that all along the way, we've been looking at this in a way that even if there were ended up being tweaks or refinement or anything else with the way that these are going to work in the book, that hopefully we would be prepared for it. And the foresight that we had there, we cast that foresight spell uh, on ourselves. We, it actually is going to pay off in this circumstance. It doesn't always... Uh, you know, come out to a win, but in this uh, circumstance, it did. And so we're really happy about that, but uh, we're, we're not going to be able to have any kind of peek at this ahead of that because we've got to wait for the book to release now for uh, what we're having to implement. So wanted to share that with everyone. And uh, that's, that's where we are with a lot of that uh, subclasses and all of those things far less of a lift for us, just like they are for, uh, you know, other books. But uh, all of this is, is intended that's being listed here uh, going to be in place when the book releases. Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. So the new annual storyline adventure is going to be here next week. So keep your eyes peeled for that as well. And this one is good. I've seen several copies of this popping up uh, across the uh, social media space and people reviewing it. And it sounds like just as advertised, it's got 
a uh, vibe of kind of like the thing and uh, some some horror elements in there. And uh, really, I, I think you can look at this picture and see that that's the vibe that they're going for. And so uh, this amazing artwork here. And uh, and so, yeah, the adventure is coming and it's going to be unlocked on d d Beyond on the release date next Tuesday. And then we are still work in progress on the Encounter Builder Random Encounter Generation. So much of the rest of what we were working on has had to take a back seat to make sure that now that we have a, a much better idea of what's coming in Tasha's that we are covering this very significant rules expansion um, ahead of the release of that. But uh, so some of the other things have been placed on hold where we can focus on that. Upcoming digital dice rolling in the player tools mobile app is in progress, uh, continues to be dice in the character builder so i got a little bit of a sneak preview of this and what the team's working on and uh it's it's going to be roll 46 drop the lowest uh like uh, what is presented in the player's handbook and it does allow you to do sets of these so uh for instance i know a lot of dungeon masters out there allow people to use that method for three sets and you can choose the uh, one set of six ability scores that are uh, the most favorable for you amongst those three sets. So you will be able to do that. Hopefully I will be able to demo that before too much longer uh, to, to show everyone. And uh, it'll also be in your hands pretty soon. And then character sheet updates. This is, continues to be a focus area for us as we're going into the new year. Things like life domain cleric uh, healing bonuses, uh, lots and lots of the very special, uh, we just call them snowflake rules that are, uh, you know, maybe unprecedented in the rest of the game, but they are very specific to a particular subclass, uh, those kinds of rules exceptions, or again, just special mechanics that classes have. We're continuing to try to uh, tackle as many of those as we possibly can, because we do want to make sure that what you want to play is available to you. And we're trying to do that in a way where you don't have to continue using some of the workarounds. So that is a big area of focus for us as we go into the back ha uh, back part of this year. We're not half anymore, back part of this year and into uh, the, the new year next year as well. Uh-oh, what, did I hit the wrong button? I did. All right, let's get to the homebrew spotlight. So let's see if I can figure this out. So will will is our producer here i'm about to do something to the screen hopefully it's not gonna mess anything up here all right so i've added a bar is the main thing there <laughs> so this is uh i don't know if you can make adjustments around that or not but um but yeah so spells we've got several of these that we're going to look at today and again we got submissions for this through discord and uh as we do this in the future we'll grab some submissions from other places too where people can have a chance to participate but i haven't seen most of these <clears throat> uh excuse me um i haven't seen most of these so we're gonna uh discover these together so first of all we've got breath of bees by tucker h Oh, let me zoom in here. Are we okay, Will, or should I? Yeah, okay. All right, here we go. So Breath of Bees by Tucker H. Breath of Bees is a third level spell. So this is serious business right here. Breathe in deeply as the smell of honey wafts around you. Bonus points for using the word wafts. That is a very good word. As you lean forward and open your mouth, a swarm of bees burst out the 30-foot cone. This would terrify me, literally terrify me. Um, I won't get into the entire story because I'm sure it is far more perilous and exciting to me than it would be uh, to you. But there was like, what do they call them? They're like um, wood bees or something like that, like I guess is what it would be. And I was uh, trying to build... Uh, a, a little fence area for a dog uh, one time. And uh, this has been, you know, a few years ago. And this would be actually drilled a hole into the post. I didn't even know bees could do that, drill holes. Um, and like basically set up some kind of a nest. I don't know, it's a, like, I don't think it's a hive, but it's like a nest or something for the bee. And uh, it just, it, it taunted me. 
it uh, irritated me, it frustrated me, it bothered me. So um, I think that it would be a really, really close uh, battle between, you know, what the bane, what my biggest enemy would be in if these games were real life. It would be between like a giant bee, would be probably, or a giant um, horse fly. So it would be really, really hard uh, toss up between those. But yeah, I would be terrified of this spell. Each creature in that area must make a dex saving throw, taking 3d6. Bees begin to circle in a 15 foot radius at the end of the 30 foot cone. Oh, this is very nice. So this is a damage spell, also a uh, crowd uh, positioning spell. Uh, you know, creating uh, terrain elements. So yeah, this is uh, this is a really solid spell at first glance. Breath of Bees by Tucker H. So then we have Convert Currency by Dave Damon. That's a moderator. Hello, Dave Damon. Let's see what we got here. He's a great moderator, but let's see if he can make spells. You touch a pile of coins no larger than a one cubic foot, weighing no more than 100 pounds. 100 pounds of coins. This is some serious adventuring here. Transfer the coins into any single denomination as long as they have the same final value and do not exceed one cubic foot. So yeah, the balancing element here, it, uh, it means that they have to have the same final value <laughs> and have to keep up uh, with roughly the same space. Any coins that cannot be converted to a whole increment of the chosen denomination remain unchanged. So yeah, this is uh, very useful in the very, uh, you know, financially based games that you have out there. Those are not my games. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, I remember in D20 Modern, there was the, I guess the wealth mechanic. And so it was just like a rating that, hey, if you were this wealthy, you could have this thing. And uh, if you were, you know, uh, poverty stricken at a wealth level, then you couldn't buy a thing and you had to talk to your uh, friend that, that had a wealth bonus that was high enough. And uh, I do have to admit that most of my games play out like that because I'm not really uh, into the penny pinching in games. But I definitely understand that there are groups and people out there playing that love this. And so the spell looks like a pretty handy utility. All right, Power Word Yeet by J Baxter 031. So let's see our Power Word Yeet. You utter, uh, this is a ninth level spell. So this is serious business right here. Let's see if this holds up. You utter a word of power, Yeet, that can compel one creature within range to be thrust vertically at terminal velocity. <laughs> If they have less than 120 hit points, they are raised to an altitude of 200 feet and then dropped. If the path is obstructed, the target slams into the obstruction and takes 10d6 bludgeoning damage and is stunned until the end of their next turn. Yeah, I think that would do it on the stunning. I would probably be stunned if I wasn't dead. If the creature falls the entire 200 foot distance, they take 20d6 fall damage. If they have more than 120 hit points, the spell fails so this is a uh, very uh, potent finisher there power word yeet very very nice one let's move to monsters slime dragon by zalora so we have a slime dragon by zalora and i kind of love this concept so I, I did see this one last night slime dragon large ooze chaotic evil i am a big fan of oozes in the game already because they are just such an alien component. So when I think of monsters and think of, you know, fascinating, terrible things that adventurers could really encounter, if I walked into a place and I saw a gray ooze doing its thing, I would just completely lose my mind, probably not continue into the place. Uh, so, so oozes uh, are, are really great creatures for, for me to use in my games. But uh, yeah, the Slime Dragon Amphibious, Amorphous, like many oozes, Acid Rain whenever it moves using its flying. Ooh, that's, that's creepy right there. So it can fly and then it's uh, uh, wing residue. <laughs> wing dew um, is going to fall on people. 
Uh, Multi-attack, of course, engulfing bite. I saw that in my head. Chomp. But it's like more of a... Uh, instead of a chomp. A pseudopod. Slime breath. Yeah, very good. So legendary actions detect, like uh, a lot of dragons have. Pseudopod. And then engulf, so it can do that for the two legendary actions. Oh, we've got some layer actions, too, here. So on initiative count 20, pseudopods whip up from the central pit and lash out at any any creature within 15 feet green slime drips from the ceiling on a random creature so yeah that makes sense for that layer and then the jellies into uh enter in from the walls so it just summons the jellies from the walls very nicely done i actually in all seriousness i i might use that in one of my games at some point that's uh that that's my kind of thing there then we have a treasure golem by mr zebub Love those treasure goblins in Diablo. So let's see what a treasure golem does. Large construct, unaligned like many constructs. And we have all that glitters. While the golem remains motionless, it is indistinguishable from a pile of treasure. Ooh, that is, I like it. So this is like a mimic in golem form. Still tricky, tricky still hitting the players where it hurts because they always want the treasure immutable form uh so it can't be uh shape changed nice magic resistance magic weapons um so it can find weapon as a free action the treasure golem can produce a weapon from within itself <laughs> ah very nice uh the creature makes two weapon attacks and a slam so yeah this is uh this is really good. Um, so yeah, a pile of gold gems and other miscellaneous values. Uh, va valuables, rather. Yeah, that's uh, that's some serious business. So maybe you can use that in your game too. I have found with my players, when I do this kind of stuff, I, I have to do it very sparingly because they get real mad when uh, you start uh, messing with the, the, the treasure. But uh your your mileage may be uh, more, more than that. Magic item, the wooden spoon by Tucker H. So Tucker H again here, and this is the wooden spoon. Uh, so like as in the wooden spoon. It uh, looks like it's a cursed item. Simple wooden spoon used for stirring. Hasn't been used much, and the wood is pristine. So the kind that I use to stir the sugar into the sweet tea. So when you touch it, a bond is formed, even if it's tossed away. From then on, whenever you search for something, whether it be your own things, a drawer, a cabinet, anything, you will find the wooden spoon first. <laughs> oh, well done. That, 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 that's good. This is the kind of item that I would use in my game. For some reason, my players don't get uh, too upset about those kind of things, but you mess with their treasure and it's over with. So yeah, the wooden spoon. Very nice. We got mortal soul contract by Xanataz, probably Xanataz mortal soul contract. It's a wondrous item. Wondrous item. This is a generic conceptual contract to be used freely in any campaign. Wording is purposely vague at points. <laughs> so it's to be freely adjusted or amended by the prospective contractual parties. Well, Xanata, are you a real life attorney here? Uh, we, the authors, assume no responsibility of liability whatsoever that may arise as a result of the unforeseen informational details. So, uh, it was was this written or was this in um, was this in uh, Descent uh, Baldur's Gate Descent to Avernus? Because some of this seems familiar, but maybe this is entirely new. I bet it is. Yeah, so this uh, really nice formatting on this uh, homebrew item. So that uh, kind of shows you what you can do there as well. Unless otherwise explicitly stated in this document, the binding terms of this contract are contained exclusively within the text of this document itself. These kinds of contracts, now this is definitely up my alley for games. I love being able to present these kinds of choices to players 
where they, uh, you know, can choose to kind of condemn themselves if, uh, if that's the route that they go with, but they get some kind of, you know, benefit, big benefit out of it. So we've got a hedge, witch by K cipher, and this is a background. So shifting to backgrounds now. So the hedge, witch, and so you can choose, uh, between a great uh, set of skills there, herbalism kits, um, and cooks utensils, brew supplies. So all of that is good. So let's look at the feature. This is what I always look at. When crafting potions that use your herbalism kit, you may reduce the time requirement of the potion by half. That's a nice mechanic. I actually am quite a fan of backgrounds that give these kinds of benefits, especially if the benefit is something that happens for downtime activity, so it's outside of any kind of combat related or even you know social or exploration uh, related things, if this is happening, uh, you know, in moments that are typically off screen or off table in a lot of games, I think that backgrounds are perfect for doing that kind of thing. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. And then I always love uh, reading the suggested characteristics too. I won't read all of them, but my stubbornness runs deep. For better or worse, I don't give up easily can relate to that. Um, I'm not content to sit still, even in my downtime. I'm forever fidgeting with some craft or the other. I can relate to that as well. I'm sitting here. You can't see it right now. You probably see my shoulders barely swaying, but like my legs are like going crazy right now because I've just got to fidget um, all the time. So, uh, so yeah, ideals, competence, anything worth doing is worth doing properly. These are good. Yeah, this is a this is a strong background here, Hedge Witch by K Cipher. And then we have <laughs> I like this one. So this was uh by uh Gidom Gidomka, Gidomka maybe. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. But this is almost the chosen one. <laughs> almost the chosen one. I love it. Uh so yeah, all of these games are typically about, you know, some former of a chosen one or another but this is almost the chosen one and actually i think that i'm trying to think like i feel like i've seen movies or shows that focus on this to some degree but uh but it's a, a very good premise for stories that it's like you know what what would it be like to be you know possibly raised or told uh consistently that you were a chosen one but then it falls through so I, I think that that's, you know, kind of interesting. I think uh, what I'm thinking of uh, is uh, Warrior Nun recently watching that. Uh, there was, you know, a character in that that was almost a chosen one. And uh, her reaction to, to what happened there was, was interesting in the show. Uh, so feature sibling of the chosen one do the stats of your sibling. People don't look in your direction if your sibling is near. Everyone is too awestruck by your sibling. And to be blunt, don't give two flying chamber pots about you. <laughs> However, you can get certain things for free, like whatever you can get your hands on while no one is looking. Sometimes you can get even a free room or service by promising the chosen one will visit an establishment. Oh, this is great. Almost the chosen one. I, I, I think I have several character ideas that I'm, going to be using this one for in the near future so well done get Amka, if i'm doing that right so let's move to feats elementalist by g80 gzt elementalist so the wisdom requirement on this feat grown in tune with minor elemental power granting you the following benefits so increases wisdom score but then you gain several cantrip cantrips Spellcasting ability for these spells is wisdom. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty powerful here, uh, granting that many cantrips in a feat. But hey, if that works at your table, that that is is really really great. And then it gives you ways to modify the different spells that you have there. So cast control flames, um, and you can target the flames. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Gust, you can knock the target prone instead of moving it five feet. I, I, I like that. that. That part right there is a really interesting use of Gust. This gives me an idea. So I like, for instance, what I've seen with playtest content, 
with the telekinetic feet uh, or telepathic feats. I think that there could be some really interesting uh, versions that would fit a mold similar to what this feat is doing for uh, kind of a collection uh, or or loadout of spells, if you will, uh, where, you know, so, so this is a great example with Gust here being able to knock the target prone. That is a really, really great option. And so that would be interesting um, to have, you know, th this is an elementalist spell that's trying to uh, cover all of the elements in this case. But, um, you know, thinking through, uh, we, we won't go all the way to air bending, but, uh, you know, air control type feet that is using uh, gust and, and some of these other, uh, you know, air control type spells and giving you ways to modify those. So, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's very interesting. Again, on this one, might be tough to allow that many extra cantrips, but... Uh, I, I really do like the uh, I, I like the ability to modify the existing spells. That's really really well done. All right, let's see. Whipmaster. Oops, get off my screen. Why is this stuff always in the way? Here we go. Whipmaster. Oh wait, who was this from? Whipmaster by Lloyd. Whipmaster by Lloyd. Through master and dedication to a long forgotten art, you've mastered the way of the whip and know how to wield it near perfectly. So plus one to uh, attack rolls you make with a whip. Damage die changes. I like that because yeah, a whip as is uh, is is, is kind of hard to use. When you hit a creature your size or smaller, use a bonus action to attack them again you know I, I i do like this uh quite a bit and it's always you know what do you choose to put into something like this because you only have so much space you only have so many things that the feet can do but i would say that um i i would love to use something like this where the whip also oh i didn't read far enough i didn't read far enough sorry you deal normal whip damage and the target is knocked prone. I really like that. So that's what I was going to say is, is being able to control the creature that you attack. So knocked prone uh, or uh, something like, you know, being able to pull them closer, uh, like, uh, you know, the thorn whip spells and, and, and those kind of things. But yeah, whip master, this is good. And I like ways that you can make some of those, um, you know, hard to justify their use of weapons in the game a lot more useful so yeah that's that's good all right so then we'll move to races we've got an aura Kokra variant by hide the bodies what a username hide the bodies so this is a penguin variant i already adore it this is amazing beacon feather sea wardens avian mannerisms so this is talking through a penguin version of an Aracocra. Icy resilience. That is very appropriate. Resistant to cold damage. Swift and wise. Dexterity score and wisdom. So all of that makes sense. Waddles. Your base walking speed is 25 feet. Oh my goodness. Oh, those happy feet. I love it. All right. So I really, really want to see all the characters that people are going to create with the Aracocra Penguin variant. I think that it's very... So I, I love the owl variants that I've seen of the Aracocras, but this is the first time that I've seen a penguin. So uh, well done with that too. Nymph by Melly DM. I know her. She is in the chat probably out there. So Nymph... Some believe that every tree, bush, and pond in the material plane are connected to the Feywild and that each contain a spirit whose sole duty is to protect it. Yeah. Love the nymphs here. So ability score increase seems very appropriate. So they're small in size. I like that. Some people make them larger, but I do like the small. That's how I envision Nature's rest. Nymphs don't need to uh, sleep. Instead, they meditate deeply. So this is uh, elfish. Speak with nature. 
So yeah, that ability to speak with nature, uh, very good. So then we have some sub races. Oh, very nice. Yeah, check out the nymph. I'm a fan of Melly's just in general, but um, but definitely a very good race. I've seen that one in the past as well. Then we have, <laughs> so, so this is a funny typo. <laughs> this is not supposed to be slim person by SJ f zone this is a slime person <laughs> they could be slim too i suppose but we've got a slime person so i said before that i like oozes so the the moderators uh and community folks that chose these i don't think they knew about my uh preference towards oozes but uh yeah we've got a several ooze themed things going on here so a uh, slime person who has that amorphous ability. I love that part. Dark vision dilution. Whenever you move by swimming, you have a disadvantage on saving throws and your movement speed is halved until the start of your next turn after you leave the water. Acidity. You may add 1d4 acid damage to any unarmed attack you make. And if you grapple, you get to deal that damage. So yeah, that's everything I would expect to see in a slime person and then I guess I need to see everybody go out there and homebrew the actual slim person that we have uh, showing here. Uh, but yeah, nicely done, SJF zone. And then finally, we will close out with some subclasses, a couple of bard subclasses here, but we've got the College of Dance by Rogar Narixius. So the College of Dance. Bards of the College of Dance are fearless performers who entertain and enchant their audiences with endearing, seductive, or technically impressive choreography while using the same skill set to strike unexpectedly at their enemies. So I already like this. I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, precedence for this kind of thing in fiction out there. So Star Dancer, so you gain skill proficiencies that are appropriate, unencumbered moves, while you're not wearing armor, you get uh, to add your... Uh, so this is an armor class effect here. Um, and, and again, that's pretty powerful there. But I do like that for the bard because I think that some of the uh, power is offset by uh, just the, the base class of the bard not being as geared towards melee combat um, and, and combat in general there, uh, you know, so a little more support uh, in, in the vein there of the, the, the monk. Aggr aggressive choreography. So uh, this is kind of something that you get when you're not wearing that armor or shield. Uh, extra attacks, so like the College of Valor. Empowered choreography. So this is the magical uh, part. So uh, very monk-like here, uh, which probably is appropriate for that. Enchanting choreography. So the 14th level ability, add your charisma modifier to the attack and damage rolls for unarmed strikes. In addition, the damage from your unarmed strikes increases to a D8 and you no longer provoke opportunity attacks after making an unarmed strike on your turn. So that that's a pretty powerful ability there for 14th level. Now, you know, Warlocks whether it's at 14th or around there, their, their uh, capping ability for uh, the, the fiend is, you know, sending someone to hell. So um, some of these abilities are, are definitely powerful. But uh, yeah, uh, overall, I really like the concept here, uh, the, the College of Dance. We have the, I'm assuming, wizard, uh, School of Tax Evasion. <laughs> Did we did we vet these? I'm not going to get into any, any kind of like political trouble here, am I? Um, focus their studies in the art of tax evasion. <laughs> oh, these mages are capable of deceiving others and detecting similar deception within others. So you know that game that I was talking about where Dave Damon's uh, convert currency would be useful? This would probably be a great subclass for a game that is really really focused on the cheddar um your training in the school of tax evasion enables you to on occasion completely avert the cost of transcribing spells into your spell book uh i, I do love that the um 
I'm going to call it silly, but it might be perfectly serious for your game. Uh, but I, I, I love the flavor element being tied uh, to, again, you know, kind of downtime activities there. That That's good stuff. Tax con man. Uh, your ability to con your way out of situations becomes <laughs> extraordinary. You gain skills, um, deceivers clarity, so you can understand when others are trying to deceive you. Silver tongued. So yeah, you're a talker. Greater tax evasion. <laughs> uh, you have progressed in your studies to the point where it's made evading taxes significantly easier. So this reduces your costs even more. Sight of the misleader, 14th level ability. Let's see what we got. Your ability to evade and cheat your way out of situations has grown to the extent where you can see through the trickery of others. Uh, you can temporarily gain true sight until the end of your next turn and a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier. I, th I think that feels, that feels pretty good there. Um, uh, again, unplay tested, but feels pretty good. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> the School of Tax Evasion by Likely April. Thank you, Likely April, for that one. College of Clowns. Oh, no. By Apples Bard. Oh, no. We have a picture. College of Clowns. Oh, let's see. Practitioner. So, again, we have some formatting going on here. Uh, practitioners of clownhood are known to travel the land, bestowing the gift of laughter to the masses. You've done that today with me, College of Clowns, using quick movement, ridiculous costumes, and slapstick comedy to tell their story. Most seek to spread joy, with uh, some using their talents to fight evil. Others still use their silly magic to spread mayhem and chaos. That's what clowns do in my head. Ridiculous defense, slapstick, uncanny dodge. Can't keep the clown down, so let's see. Say it with me. It means crazy clowns just won't die for some reason. And adventures such as yours, they tend to linger long past their welcome. <laughs> maybe, maybe this homebrew segment has lasted long past its welcome, so I apologize if it has. They linger and linger and linger, and just when you think you're totally fed up with their bull... Thanks for your, your censoring there. And you can't take another second of it. They just linger some more. And you never know what they're up to. And they're always scheming in the shadows. And it's quite possible that whatever master plan they're hatching just doesn't make the slightest bit of sense at all. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how stupid the clown schemes are or how sick of him everybody is. He just won't die. So then we get to the ability itself at 14 level <laughs> once a day. You can add your charisma modifier to your death saving throws after being knocked unconscious once. If you regain consciousness after using the ability, you can instead choose to uh, cast feign death on yourself without components and without using a spell. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Apple's Bard. Um, this has been incredibly enjoyable to, to read that subclass so yeah i hope everyone enjoyed getting a peek at some of the great homebrew that's being made by the community out there uh, again some of it uh is is, is fun uh, those are elements that i love in my own D, &D games uh you know you know, the world is a pretty serious place out there right now, and uh, some of the lightheartedness is uh, welcome, at least for me and my players. Uh, so I hope you can get some mileage out of that. And then uh, some of these really, really useful that I can see myself using uh, even in, uh, you know, more serious games. Uh, that Slime Dragon is je definitely going to make an appearance at some point. Um, and so, yeah, these are really great. Thanks, everybody, for submitting them. Uh, I, I, I had a good time with, with that segment and we'll continue to spotlight some of the great work that the community is doing out there in future streams as well. So we're going to transition to questions now.